everybody okay? <laughs> now everybody okay? So that's Hetty and I'm Ann, in case you're wondering. And I'm going to speak first, and Hetty's going to speak second to give you a little insight into the way this might happen today and who we are a little bit. Uh, I'm a theater director, and I was brought up postmodern. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, which meant literally deconstruct, deconstructing. I mean, the, the, the modernism led to the toppling of hierarchy. I, I, it's not all going to be this heady, I promise. But <laughs> the toppling of hierarchy, and suddenly we live in a world where we can take things apart and pick them up, each having the equal importance. And I very much come out of that tradition. And as a theater director, I started directing, by the way, when I was 15. And it was the bald soprano. <laughs> I know, and it's really uh, remarkable because it was at a, a horrible high school called Middletown High School in Middletown, Rhode Island. I mean, a horrible high school. <laughs> and, and we normally did, you know, Oliver and, 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 and uh, Brigadoon and all these things. And I had a French teacher. I didn't mean to start this, but I'm telling you anyway. I had a French teacher who uh, was actually enlightened and taught me about art. The first time I saw anything other than a Disney movie, because I was brought up in the Navy, was, um, was my French teacher, Jill Warren. And she, uh, uh, took us to see Elvira Madigan. Does anybody remember? <laughs> Groans. And I remember it changed my life. I, you know, the, the scenes of like running across fields and catching butterflies and throwing up. I don't know. <laughs> and I said, oh, this is what art is. And I got really excited. And uh, I went back to see it years and years later. And it's the silliest movie. <laughs> Anyway, but I digress. Uh, oh, Jill Warren decided to do The Bald Soprano. It was 1967 in Middletown, Rhode Island. Not a good idea. And, and theater was done in the, um, in the, if anybody remembers this word, cafetorium, <laughs> where theater always smelled like lunch. <laughs> And it, it was, there was a, 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 you know, it was the, the, the uh, where you have lunch, and at the end of, at one side, there's a curtain and some flags, and then the curtain opens, and there's a play at night. So anyway, we did all those plays there, and my, my high school teacher, Jill Warren, got sick a week and a half, and I was her assistant, which meant running around looking for props during classes and having a hall pass, um, <laughs> until she called me and said, and this is, this sounds like a, 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 a you know, a Hollywood story, but it's true. She called me and said, I'm sick and you have to take over. <laughs> Seriously. And um, I really didn't mean to plan to tell the story, but I'm going to finish it <laughs> to get to postmodernism. So I had to, at the age of 15, learn about what this play was. And um, uh, all the right things happened. Number one, the guy playing Mr. Smith, his name was Jimmy Cometti. We kind of, Cometto, we kind of fell in love and chased after each other. So love was good. <laughs> and the second thing was, beyond all expectations, it was a huge hit. So at the age of 15, I said, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to be a director. <laughs> anyway, and you know, we, you know we, we, we're going to talk about neuroscience. And I, sometimes I think, as much as I've studied you know, performance theory and directing, and I'm always studying, I think that I still direct the same way I did when I was 15. Like there's something about the sense of space and the sense of timing and the sense of humor that was already there. So I'm, I'm a little conflicted about that, but I try to get better whenever I can. Anyway, so moving into the world as a director, I won't give you any more biographical information after high school, unless you want it. But uh, uh, what I did naturally, because that's what was happening then in terms of art and thinking, was postmodernism. And so I started deconstructing. I deconstructed everything. And it was very much, you know, in this, in, certainly in the 70s when I was in college and out, it was the thing, you know, you deconstructed. I'm telling you this because at a certain point, and it certainly happened a little bit after 9-11. I started feeling like postmodernism has to be over. It just has to finish. That we have de deconstructed to a point where there's no meaning anymore. And that, 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 that what once had great meaning, you take things apart, put them together again in a meaningful way, suddenly seemed wrong. And what I started becoming aware of is the necessity 
to reimagine storytelling, to understand what stories mean. Now, in order to do that in this as, a, as of yet unnamed post postmodernism, you have to say, well, what is a story? But not only that, whose story is it? And who is it for? How does it function in the theater? I'm not interested in, in deconstructing anymore. I'm not interested in effect, if you know what I mean, you know, directorial effect. It's, it's become uh, important in our time to connect with one another through stories, but not perhaps in the way they used to be told. So uh, uh, armed, all of us are armed with the, the tools that, that postmodernism taught us, how do we move forward? And one, one of the things that's really fed me is a study of neuroscience. And I'm so delighted that Hetty's here. And I'm, I'm hoping that um, I, I, I'm going to be very selfish today is I'm going to actually, I've been testing some theories out about how neuroscience applies to storytelling and theater. And I want to try them out on Hetty. We have not discussed this beforehand. <laughs> because I, I've like I studied neuroscience, and then I think that's fantastic for the theater. I will try to tell you what I've learned, and I hope Hetty will tell me where I'm getting it wrong. Because I do tend to say it a lot, and I don't want to get the stories wrong. So, so that, that's a little bit of an introduction of where I'm coming from. Now, Hetty, you're going to tell us where you're coming that's from. That sounds fun. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think I started uh, becoming interested in psychology as soon as I could think. And the people around me had always been uh, a fascinating bunch. And how they affected me and how I think and how I feel um, had always been very salient. And so uh, the interest in psychology and how, um, in particular, the way that we think about our experience fundamentally changes the way that we feel about it um, has been uh, carrying me really through to my work today. Um, it's much less magical how I became interested in the brain. I didn't even really uh, think about the brain until I came to college. And I was uh, at Columbia, actually, as an undergraduate. And um, it became fascinated with the fact that we can not only use the brain to understand our psychology, but we can also use the brain to test theories about how changing how we think about our experience and how we think about other people or the stories that we tell ourselves fundamentally change our brain activity and fundamentally changes how we feel, which I think is also what brings me here today. Because um, even in my lab now, what we do is try to um, use that knowledge or use the insight that one can change one's narrative uh, to help people deal with things like addictions, with uh, eating problems, um, and also to understand how people can use uh, mindfulness and meditation uh, to really change the way that they live life in general. And I'm uh, excited for this conversation with you today. Great. Well, so, so maybe I'll, I'll, I have two two areas of neuroscience in relationship to theater I'd like to bring up, and then maybe we can free flow from there. One of them is memory, and the other is mirror neurons. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll take care of you. Um, so so, so I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about wh what I understand about memory. And a lot of it could be really false. Because I tend to study and then get excited about one aspect. And then I take it and say, oh, I found the solution to everything <laughs> through neuroscience. <laughs> so what I learned is that memory is, is actually a protein. Um, and that actually when we form memories, we are actually uh, forming a protein in the brain that is accessed through uh, synaptical process, through synapses. That when we want to remember something, we access, uh, uh, I'm, I'm questioning about the protein part, a protein <laughs> in the brain and how I imagine it, uh, the pro that the act of memory actually changes the memory. Do you know that theory that, you know, if you, if you, so, so if you're in a couple and one of you remembers the first kiss and the other one never thinks about it, the person who remembers the first kiss most actually has the falsest memory. <laughs> and the person who doesn't remember it much, when that person remembers it, it's closest to what actually happened because we tend to change it every time. So, you know. <laughs> So I started thinking, I got very excited about the idea that, that, that memory as a protein is actually an anatomical fact. So as a theater director, when we make theater, of course, a great theater experience is one in which, which creates memory, that you remember it. I mean, you've been to theater performances where you walk out, and by the time you're in the parking lot, you've forgotten it, right? 
not so great, perhaps. I mean, maybe it was entertaining, which is one seventh of what the theater does, but the the uh, but but actually, then it's gone. And and I've, I think I'm, I'm obviously, as as most theater people are, is want to create memories that endure. And so I look back at productions I've seen, you know, even 15 years, and I think each of us in this room can do this. Maybe some not 15 years, but younger people could look back two years. <laughs> remember remember a, a production you saw, and what do you remember? Like, what comes back? Not analytically, but literally what, what remains. And so this notion of, um, of, of, of building, of creating memories as a, as a real uh, physical event that happens in the theater uh, uh, brings a huge responsibility in a sense. And, and I do think that if, if the theater were a verb, it would be to remember or to remember, to put the members back together again. And I think that our, our, our job in the theater is, is an extraordinary job, which is to finish the sentences of people who died without finishing what they had to say. In other words, is to look back find out what certain people were saying and try to finish, to, if not finish, at least continue the sentences that they're making. So the idea of study, creating something in the present moment that forms memories and actually changes people in the, in the theater is, is an idea that's very, very exciting to me, as opposed to just making shows. That there's something between the audience and the stage that's happening is rather profound. How that works through association. And the other thing I understand, and I'd love to, a correction on this, is that what seals memory, and I like to think of it this way, it's probably far too simplistic, is emotion. In other words, in the heat of emotion, you create the proteins that endure. OK, Hetty, tell me. <laughs> OK, so you just said a lot. I'm going to try to break it down into a few pieces. OK. Um, I'll start with the idea of proteins. I actually I like how you describe it, but you are correct in saying that that's not entirely really how it works. <laughs> <laughs> so and I'm not actually a memory researcher. It's not, you know, some people spend every day, every moment of their entire lives scientifically trying to think about how to test exactly the building blocks of memory and how they work. Um, and so it's true to say that one of the building blocks of creating memories and kind of the, the um, minimal molecular sense of it is actually protein dependent. So certain proteins have to be uh, created uh, in order for memories to take place. And one of the findings that I think is, uh, is really remarkable uh, in that area is that not only are the memories needed for the initial laying down of the memory, but that um, every time that you re-remember the same memory, interrupting that kind of protein synthesis will actually interrupt the reconsolidation or the re-remembering of that memory. Wait, where's the protein then? So it's everywhere in the brain. Really, every neuron in your brain, every cell in your brain, a neuron is just a brain cell. So in the um, creation of a memory, how does it work? Um, do you want me to draw it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so, so you can think about uh, neurons in the brain as meeting each other across uh, little spaces called synapses. Uh -huh. And in the process of neuronal communication, um, one neuron will release some um, uh, neurotransmitters or little chemicals that will uh, transverse that little space and then attach themselves to special sites called receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. So this would be the presynaptic neuron. This would be the postsynaptic neuron. And in the middle, we have a little space. This one will send some chemicals out, and this one will receive it on particular receptors. Um, the proteins that might get created, for example, are additional receptors mm -hmm. that will then get created and essentially shuttle themselves to the edge of that synapse so that the next time that this neuron sends um, information in the form of chemicals, this neuron is now more ready to receive it because of those proteins. Um, there are other proteins that are involved. This is just one example. This is one type of protein that gets synthesized in the process of memory, specifically in the context of long-term potentiation. Um, what that that allows is for the next time the communication happens in this set of neurons, it's facilitated. It happens more easily. And that's like the retrieval of that memory or the uh -huh. repetition of that pattern. And But we really can't think about it as happening only in one synapse. There are 100 billion neurons in the brain, right? So, so many, which means that there are that many more synapses because every neuron can sometimes uh, synapse onto uh, thousands of other neurons. So the, 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 it's a very, very inter- uh, connected network. And what that means is that memories are really um, patterns that get activated 
uh, in the brain that can then, which makes it again more easily reactivated at, at, at a different time in the future. They're patterns. Yeah, more they're than, patterns. That's actually helpful. They're patterns that so, are based so, on proteins. So let me ask you a question. So you saw Steel Hammer last night. I did. And if you, without rigor, thought, just remembered a, a, a moment from it, could you tell us what that moment was and then how that happened in your head? Ah. <laughs> so the moment that, there are a few moments that, that strike me really, really intensely. Um, the first is when they first started singing, uh, very angelic. Um, and I was interested in what they were saying and trying to understand whether that I was hearing it the way that they were saying it. Um, the scene where they were running in circles really, really hit me and I returned to it many, many times since last night. So I probably now remember it completely incorrectly. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there was one moment where I was looking at the pianist and she was very, very intensely playing. And then I shifted my gaze um, to one of the women and they were dancing. Um, and something about that moment, I think, mm. also is hitting me very visually. Um, how this happened in my brain. So what likely so happened. So just now what happened. Yeah, so yeah. what happened just now is likely that a single cue, so your question, mm -hmm. um, activated the beginning of a pattern. And yeah. that pattern, we can think about it almost as a spreading activation from, uh, it's as if I went to you and whispered something to you, and then you whispered it to him, and you whispered uh. it to him, right? It kind of spread around the room as a kind of spreading activation that allowed for a particular sense, including probably an element of an emotion, an element of the, um, kind of the representation of the space in the room and where I was relative to the space in the room. Mm -hmm. um, some element of motor activity that probably got encoded uh, in my brain, echoing the motor activity almost as if I were doing it. Um, and then some part of the activation is also the mere binding of all of those elements together. What binds it? Ah, that is something that is currently an active area of investigation. I'd be lying if I told you that we as a field understood it perfectly. Um, but at least in the early parts of memory creation, there's a part of the brain that's responsible for binding or that at least does some part of the binding, huh. and that's a hippocampus, especially for spatial um, relationships. Right. Um, but the understanding exactly of how memory gets created is, is really not there yet, right? So we understand certain things like um, when you learn uh, particular words, right? So we're still, we're not even about remembering full on plays. We're about still studying it in kind of a minimal context of mm -hmm. when you study words, we know that neural activity in particular parts of the brain uh, are predictive of you remembering at a later time. When we remember, by the way, um, information about other people, different parts of our brain actually predict uh, our ability to remember them. And those are actually related to um, uh, parts of the brain that allow us to do do that kind of work that projects us into someone else's mind and allows us to understand what they're thinking. You know, it's so interesting you use the word predict because I realized not so long ago, this I couldn't have known at 15, it took a lot of study, that actually what we do in, in the theater and in a lot of the arts, like music, is we deal with people's predictions and expectations. In other words, in music you set up a melody that creates a, uh, a prediction in the mind of the audience for the next note, correct? And then when you change the note, it's called surprise. And then, so, and in the theater, you, de you deal constantly with two issues. One is you can either set up a, an expectation, which is what we're doing all the time. An actor does it every time they start to reach for the bottle. I can fulfill it, that's one thing, or I can break the expectation that is set up. So I have, this is not really a question, it's just that you, you mentioned it, yeah. and I realized that so much about art is about dealing with, with the, uh, the viewer or the, the audience's prediction of what's going to happen next. I think that's a fascinating uh, issue that you're bringing up. I was just thinking about it this morning as I was thinking about uh, our conversation, and you really should know she didn't tell me any of the things that she was gonna ask me. We were relying on spontaneity here. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I was thinking about it because as I was sitting through the play yesterday, one of the things that um, really got me was a degree to which theater is one medium by which we allow other people to resonate with us. And I'm saying us in this case yeah. as the people who are actually producing yeah. um, the play. So there's, um, there's now uh, what I think is kind of becoming famous research in communication and empathy um, that suggests that, that one of the things that we do, and actually one of the things that you guys are all doing now as I'm speaking 
in hearing me, your brains are now starting to resonate uh, with my brain, right? The pattern of brain activity, even just initially in the motor cortex, in all of your, uh, sorry, in the auditory cortex, as you're listening, is starting to follow the same kind of activity um, as my brain is doing. And as you understand, if you are all speaking English and you understand what I'm saying, then other parts of your brain that, tra that translate the meaning of what I'm saying are also starting to uh, have a similar pattern of brain activity to mine. And there's one other thing, too, which is your voice. Yeah. In other words, your voice, I think that a lot in the theater, that the voices of the actors massage the audience. I mean, literally, physically. And yes. your voice is a massage. Yes, that is, there, there is or actually. As, as, as Marshall McLuhan started out by saying the, the message is, the, 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 the medium. medium is the message. And then by the end of his life, he said the medium is the massage. And he meant it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I think that's really remarkable because that's a, an example, I think, of where someone who is not a neuroscientist to some degree <laughs> has an insight that it's will okay. then take neuroscientists a very, very long time to actually establish as a scientific uh, finding, yeah. right? And so really only uh, over the last... I don't know, maybe seven or eight years, and a lot of this uh, work specifically on verbal communication uh, is done at Princeton by uh, an, another Israeli researcher called Uri Hassan. And, um, and what he's found is that that is exactly what happens. You're obviously not physically massaging it, but in the sense that your motion, your verbal motion, is actually altering the shape, the physical shape of the, the brain activity of the listener. Right. Theater's amazing. Theater. It's why I'll never do film or television, is because the phenomenon of us being in the room together right now is so rich. And it's becoming rarer because of the screen, because we, uh, our life has become so mediated that the radical nature of theater is extraordinary, which is why I think we have to reconstruct after deconstructing. I'm going to jump to a whole other neuroscientific uh, subject. Yeah. But it has to do with empathy that you just mm -hmm. brought up, which is uh, uh, it's something that excited me tremendously. And again, I'm going to tell it as a story. And uh, this is how I remember it. So I think in the, in the late 1980s or 90s, I forgot, there was some Italian neuroscientists who uh, were working with McKay. McKay, is that how you say them? The, 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 um, macaques. the monkey. Maca the monkeys? Macaques. Yeah, macaques. And uh, some neuroscientist, I've really turned it into a story. This is maybe not at all what happened. He walked in after lunch, <laughs> and they had hooked up the, maca the macaques. Is that how you say it? Uh -huh. uh, they had them hooked up, and they were, uh, with, I guess, with an fMRI. Were, no, they were tracing their <laughs> something or other. Anyway, this sounds obvious, monkey see, monkey do. They noticed that as, uh, as one monkey was watching another monkey, uh, uh, lift a banana, the same uh, synaptic patterning was happening in the watcher, in the, in, the, in the monkey that was watching as the monkey doing. Now that is extraordinary. And when I heard about that research, I thought, that's extraordinary. And so in, 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 uh, in looking at how that relates to an actor and an audience member, it gets really interesting in that it's not that, not only is the audience recreating the, uh, the uh, synaptical patterns that, of the movement of the actor, but they are also restricting themselves from moving. In other words, I'm doing this gesture, you might be doing it with me, but you're also restraining yourself. Civilization is restraint, they say, <laughs> Mr. Trump. Uh, as, uh, <laughs> They're actually restraining themselves. You're, you're restraining yourself from doing my gesture with me. OK, that got really interesting because I think, oh, again, it's a real physiological thing that's happening between the uh, audience and the actor. Then in the 90s, there was a, another uh, neuroscientific study in, um, in, in England uh, where some British neuroscientists got members of the Royal National Ball Royal Ballet and a capoeira chorus, capoeira group. You know, capoeira is a Brazilian uh, martial art. And started hooking them up as they watched each other do the moves. What happened is, as the uh, ballet dancer dance, watched dancing and was hooked up with what? What would they be hooked up with? FMRI? I don't actually know that study. Okay. But you can tell me about it. <laughs> yes. This is what happens. It's not just monkeys, but human beings. 
uh, also have these things which then became called mirror neurons. There are some neurophysicists who say this is nonsense and does not happen, but I really like it. <laughs> so, um, so it turns out that a dancer watching another dancer dance, their mirror neurons are going cuckoo. Obviously, a capoeira dancer watching a capoeira dancer dance, mirror neurons go cuckoo. But a capoeira dancer watching a ballet dancer, not so much. So in other words, the more familiar you are with the movement, the more action will be happening neuro, uh, with mirror neurons. Now, why that's important for the theater, I thought, I had to then make the, the connection, is that in the theater, of all the art forms, it is the one that comes closest to life. In other words, except maybe representational painting, but actually you watch people who are standing, walking, sitting, reaching, kissing, you know, the, 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 the behavior which has to be reinvented, that's a whole other thing. You can't just behave on stage, you actually have to reinvent behavior. That's another subject. And so the theater, more than dance, unless you're a dancer, because you're familiar with the moves, you will actually have more synaptic uh, activity. All right. I, I've gone far enough, and now will you take it apart, please? Um, can I not take it apart? So the, the bit about mirror neurons, I think you actually described really well. So what they were doing is um, they were doing single unit recordings, which is it's a little bit sad for the monkeys, but they actually have electrodes inserted into their brain um, where they're able to record neural activity from single neurons. And what they discovered is actually very similar to what you said, that um, uh, similar neurons in, in both monkey brains and two particular areas that I guess that their identity is less important, but there are um, neurons in, in, in the observer and in the uh, actor that will act in unison when the actor does something simple like hold a banana. And they have found very, very similar uh, findings in humans um, that are really related to our ability to imitate, right? Of course, we would need to, to have some mechanism by which we can look at each other and learn from observation, which you all know from your personal experience you do all the time. Um, and so uh, what I think is more controversial is not whether there are neurons or even neural systems, clusters of neurons, that would um, activate in my brain when I watch someone uh, act in a particular way, but whether that is really the basis for all of empathy or not, mm. right? And I think that um, where the thinking is today is that yes, there are um, parts of our brain, specifically um, motor parts and sensory, sensory parts that might echo uh, in activity um, what we see, what we see in the world around us. But that is probably only part of what really underlies our ability to fully empathize with what is happening in, in, in a play or really in life in general. Um, it's probably more related to our ability to do um, maybe the, the experience sharing part of empathy, right? So the ability to, to fully feel what someone else is feeling or to fully experience what they are feeling and resonate uh, within us. And I think part of it is also related to what we just talked about in communication, because in theater, our brain ends up being, um, can reflect both the, the speech that we're hearing and the meaning that gets delivered, mm -hmm. the action that we're seeing physically. So there's really a binding of a few different parts of experience that allows the viewer in theater to resonate with what is happening on stage on a, on a neuro, neuroscientific level mm -hmm. or on a neural level. Um, what probably also happens that doesn't rely on something like mirror neurons is that we also use a more cognitive part um, of empathy and do something like theory of mind. So we also theorize and um, uh, speculate about the meaning of what it is that we're seeing. And that's our ability to um, uh, maybe interpret is a good word, interpret what it is that we think mm -hmm. that we're seeing. And that doesn't really rely on mirror neurons in the same way. Um, what's really interesting, and this is work by uh, Jamil Zaki, who's a friend of mine and a, a, from grad school and a neuroscientist now at Stanford, um, is that he's shown that neural activity both in um, the, the kind of uh, parts of the brain that are typically more related to experience sharing and parts of the brain that are related to, sh to theory of mind, both of them together come to predict how accurate we are. So accuracy in, in understanding what someone else is experiencing comes both from resonating with how they're feeling um, on a more, more experience sharing level, but also from uh, accurately um, recruiting uh, the parts of our brain that allow us to speculate on it con cognitively and kind of think about what it is that they might be experiencing in that moment. And I think that uh, a really effective uh, theatrical experience allows us to really uh, be uh, fully engaged on both of those levels. Can I, can I pick up on then, then the, which is theory, uh, 
theory of mind, which is I understand that my job as a theater director working with actors and designers is to come up with moments that release associations in the audience. And that you can, you can do two things, one of two things. You can either create a moment where everybody feels the same thing, uh, Steven Spielberg. Um, everybody feels the same thing, or you can create a moment where everybody feels something different or has a different association. I'm not a Spielberg fan, except for his <laughs> politics, but uh, uh, the, because I, I, it's really easy to make me cry, you know? I, I cry at ads, you know? Or you, <laughs> you have a dog and a little boy crossing a field and holding on to each other. I guarantee we would all watch it and we would all feel the great communal or sort of cheapened sense that we're all feeling exactly the same thing. To me, to create a moment which releases, for one person is thinking about their mother, another person, it reminds them of something, another person is thinking of the future, and that that, to me, is a great moment of theater, is to find an ideograph, which is, idio is idea and graph is to write. You write in space, you write on the stage, is to find something which releases in every audience member something different. I've come to understand that the, the art that makes everybody feel the same is actually fascistic. <laughs> Seriously, if you look at fascist architecture, it makes everybody feel small and impressed. But if you look at human, humanist architecture, everybody feels very present and differentiated. It's easy to make people feel small, but it's a much greater skill is to create a moment that releases. So I wonder what that is in the brain. That's really interesting. I was thinking about that actually throughout the play yesterday. So I, I noticed that there's a lot of play on um, uh, resonance and consonance. So even in the music itself, right, there are parts What that are, the hell are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> So, um, so it seemed like there were moments, for example, where um, the music was uh, very, very. Um, I'm not, and I'm not a musician, so maybe I'm not using the right kind of uh, um, the right kind of words. But parts where the, the the three women, for example, they were singing all together, and mm -hmm. parts where they were actually singing uh, apart, or where the music was in minor. Mm -hmm. um, with the actors as well, right? Parts where they were dancing perfectly together and moving mm -hmm. in unison, whereas parts where were clearly intentional, where they were starting to diverge from each other, sometimes at like slightly different um, uh, tempos from each other or making different motions uh, and moving kind of together in motion and then breaking it apart and then together in motion, breaking it apart. Like the beginning scene, I think is a perfect example of that. Um, and I was wondering if you, if, if you were doing that essentially on purpose, and I think that what you're saying now is that that was uh, in fact what you were thinking about, yes. that you don't want everybody to be uh, perfectly together in the room, that you're not intending for everybody to kind of feel like they're all having the same experience, but that in some ways you also don't want them to be perfectly apart. Yeah. You want them to come together and then break it apart. But isn't that the definition of pluralism? <coughs> yeah, that may be the definition and of pluralism. And what, what the theater does is two things simultaneously, is you're tell, you tell a story, you know, it, a guy kills his father and sleeps with his mother, you know, those are great stories. <laughs> and, <laughs> So, or, you know, you look at Death of a Salesman, you look at, you look at all the great plays, and so the audience is, is having two experiences simultaneously. On one hand, they're following the story, and that's in the, pre again, you'll correct me, in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. You're watching, you're judging, you're making expectations, you're, 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 but there's a whole other play that's going on in a, in a more primitive part of the, of the brain, which is you are learning about how these people are getting along together. In other words, uh, every production, the cast proposes a way social systems can function. And that's happening on a more subliminal level. Have you ever, you know, in the theater we often say, you, or we don't, I think, uh, that you can't hide a bad rehearsal process in the play. The audience feels the politics of the rehearsal room in how people notice each other or react or how they, their, their kinesthetic relationships, you know. And so one's responsibility in the theater is to create an ideal society in the rehearsal room that then is felt and is one of the two stories that the audience carries away with them. Which is why I think when Stanislavski in 1922-23 came to the United States with his company, the, Roy the, the Royal, the Moscow Art Theater, uh, uh, post-revolution, 
and performed uh, uh, Chekhov and, and, and Gorky. Uh, uh, and, and, and in New York, they toured. They were really broke at the time because it was after the revolution. Uh, uh, they toured. And in New York, completely galvanized a very young generation of early 20 20 year olds whose names are like, oh, Lee Strasberg, Stella Adler, you know, uh, uh, Harold Clerman, et cetera. And they formed the group theater from that. Anyway, I used to think that what they were seeing was a different uh, approach to acting, and that's what they were interested in and galvanized by. But I, now I think that when they saw those productions, they had never seen people act that way before together. They had never seen a social system. You know, we come from a country which before Stanislavski came here, it was about melodrama, vaudeville, hierarchical acting systems. And suddenly you're seeing people act in a very different way. But what gets really interesting, and I hate to digress, but I'm going to, is that Stanislavski was very, very influenced by Pavlov. And also concurrently in 1922, and also during the times when, when he actually directed those plays that he brought to the States, which was actually much earlier, it, it was concurrent to uh, you know, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It was concurrent to the birth of, uh, of Cubism, Picasso and Brock. It was concurrent to uh, uh, special rel relativity, that there were these breakthroughs in science and in, in the world, which, which somehow interested this group of theater people. And what our job is to do is to translate that in, those breakthroughs, into how we are function together as people. Because the subject of the theater, unlike any other art form, including dance, is always how are we getting along? How are the actors getting along? How is the audience getting along? How are the actors and the audience getting along? Not only are the plays about social systems, the great ones that are falling apart, and you watch them try to find rebalance from a state of imbalance, but in the room, there is actually this real thing happening about us trying to get along. I actually feel in this room today, we're getting along beautifully. <laughs> no, really, your timing is very good. And, uh, and, and that's, that's key. Uh, um, and so, so this extraordinary thing that is the theater, we actually create model societies to propose. I believe that Stanislavski's company, the Moscow Art Theater, ha was acting in a way that was different than, than we had known before. And it, it managed to change the paradigm of how social systems function. I think we're going through another change now and it's radical, and I have something to say about that, but I, I want to make sure if you have anything to add. I have add. a question to ask you when you're done, but I want you to finish what you were. I'm, I'm finished until the next bit, which is related. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I was wondering is, so when you, when you create a piece of theater, given the fact that you want everybody to get along, do you think more about what you want to say or how, what you want them to hear, what you want the audience to hear? I concentrate much more on the question and not the answer. If, if I concentrated on the answer, the audience would feel it's a didactic show. <clears throat> but if I get all of us as a company involved in a very compelling question, I mean, with Steel Hammer, it's who the hell was John Henry? And what is that story? And why is that story important? I can't say that we deliver an answer, but we actually share the questioning process. So to focus on the question is key. And how does it feel like when you feel like people don't get the question? So you said today it feels like everybody's getting each other. It's so painful. <laughs> and it's, it's, I think that, you know, when I was a young director, I used to, I used to pick my arms, like in, during performances, because I was so upset and nervous and watching what was rehearsing, what was working. What, the actors used to come up to me after the show when I was like in my 20s, and they say, show us your arms. <laughs> we want to know how we did today. And if they were covered with blood, <laughs> they, it wasn't a good show. <laughs> it's so painful. Once somebody said, yeah, you know, Anne, you should take a Valium. So I did one day, I took a Valium, and it was terrible because things went wrong and I went, oh, great. <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think that actually relates to what you were saying before about how emotion cements our experience, right? Because what Valium does in some ways is turn off your ability to fully experience your emotions. Mm. Um, and so in that, you were not able to, to fully experience what was happening in, room, in the room and respond to it fully. Yeah. And your memory of that day, probably to some degree, has been reduced. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was rich. I don't remember much about it. I just remember <laughs> thinking I won't do that again. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to take this the next step. So if, if the theater is about social systems, that every play asks, how are we getting along? Uh, one of the things that I've been involved in and part of in the theater is, um, is an improvisational movement that becomes very much out of the postmodern dance world. And I've sort of, I've not sort of, I hate the word sort of, or the two words. I've, the, the, uh, I've very much taken um, advantage of, of this work called The Viewpoints and applied it to theater and making plays. And it's, a, it's an improvisational message, method called The Viewpoints. And it's very, very postmodern in the sense that it breaks down the hierarchy of what's most important. So in the theater, you used to say, the text is most important, then it's movement, then it's light. You, know, you just say, what's most important? What, what, what this postmodern look does is breaks it down, says space is as important as time, and they can talk to each other. So anyway, for years, I've worked with actors on this, uh, uh, you could call it an improvisational technique called the viewpoints. And um, uh, uh, I started studying neuroscience about, I don't know, like 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more. And when I'm really interested in something, the way I really have discipline to study it is to make a play about it. Otherwise, I don't do the reading. I get lazy and procrastinate. So I have a deadline. So I decided to do a play, and it ended up, ended up being called uh, uh, Who Do You Think You Are? Uh, about neuroscience. And so I was studying and studying, and I went to North Carolina to Chapel Hill to do a workshop with um, um, actors from the Playmakers Rep and the uh, graduate actors from uh, uh, University of North Carolina. And I was doing a viewpoints workshop with them. And while I was there, I had a friend who's a, a vocal coach. And she said, oh, I hear you're interested in neuroscience. I said, yes, I am. She said, um, I have a friend who's a neurophysicist. And his name is R. Grant Steen. And I said, oh my god, I'm reading his book right now. That's fantastic. He lives in Chapel Hill? She said, yes. And uh, she said, would you like to meet him? I said, I'd love to. It was a book for lay people to try to understand neuroscience. And uh, I said, I'd love to. So we had a dinner, the three of us. And he was a very nice guy, not a theater guy at all, very much a neuroscientist. And we had a great, <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. But <laughs> the, the, so we had a lovely dinner. And at the end of dinner, I said, would you like to come to um, the final open viewpoints showing that we're doing a public showing with these uh, graduate students and actors at the end of a 10-day workshop? He said, sure. So he shows up. And we do an open viewpoints improvisation, which is, again, about movement, non-hierarchical movement, et cetera. At the end of it, we had a Q&A, which we're also going to have in a few minutes here. Uh, and and, and um, he raised his hand, our Grant Steen. And he said, what I just saw is how the brain works. I said, what? <laughs> he said, yes, the way the synapses, I'm not going to say it all wrong. The way, he said it very eloquently that the way that the actors were communicating on stage was a reflection of how the brain works. I suddenly realized why the viewpoints is interesting in our time today, because it is also showing a new way that people can be together, where the onus of creation is on the stage rather than from some uh, Mussolini director. But actually, the creation is happening on the stage, and that how these actors were moving together was proposing a different way that people may be together in this world of the internet, in the world of breakthroughs in neuroscience, in other sciences. And, uh, and, and that I wanted to share with you, because uh, I thought it I was so excited. I think that is really exciting. Yeah. And I think that um, I can almost feel what it must have been for him to see something like that organized visually, because we actually rarely get to see visually how the brain organizes. He was organizes. excited. Yeah. yeah. So and that's what I do over there. <laughs> <gasps> yeah. I think that in, in a lot of ways, um, coming together in ensembles right, is something that the brain does all the time. And in fact, memories, in some ways, is the act of ensembles, ensembles of neurons that get activated together. There you um, go. Yeah. And in that sense, right, again, that, that kind of resonance that people might be feeling, there's a study by uh, this lab at Princeton that I mentioned before um, where they had someone tell a story 
um, while they're in an fMRI scanner and their brain activity was recorded. And then they took the story and then uh, played it to then a group of participants who were in the scanner. And as the, the uh, people were listening to the story, um, they recorded their brain activity. And what they did later is that they, um, they actually traced essentially the time series, right? Like literally the, the appearance of the, the wave um, in each of the neurons in the brain. And what they found is uh, that not only um, are there uh, clusters of uh, neurons that we already know work together, but there are clusters of regions that work together um, mm -hmm. that are responsible for for processing the sound itself, processing the meaning uh, of the sound. And, uh, and they did that in part by taking the, the, the sound properties um, of the same story uh, and, and, and playing just that by reversing it, for example. Um, or they uh, translated the story to Russian and played it where you get the sounds, but unless you actually speak Russian, you don't get the meaning. Mm. Um, and they saw that really to fully reconstruct what it is that we're interacting with, there needs to be that kind of spontaneous, non-hierarchical uh, ensemble of parts of the brain that work together um, to, to create um, our understanding of, of what we're seeing. And I think that um, seeing it in terms of uh, brain activity uh, is really exciting. Mm -hmm. And when you can kind of bring it to life, um, that's even more exciting in the context of theater. And I wonder if you knew all these things, right, from I don't know how long ago was this? That was like 10 years ago, yeah. So you've now known this for 10 years. How does that continue to drive the way that you do theater? Does, has it changed it in any way? now that you know some of these? It simply gave me courage. I think, you know, I, I study a lot, and I think I study ultimately and work on projects to actually re maintain courage. So what he said gave me courage to continue, because one is always full of self-doubt, and, and uh, you know, working on, on, on Steel Hammer has given me courage to do things that I wouldn't have done before Steel Hammer. So, uh, you know, we should probably open this up to, um, it's time to open it for questions. All right. Would any, there's actually two, we've been told to say, yes. <laughs> I just don't want to be blamed for you having to get up out of your seat. <laughs> there are two microphones. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. If anybody else has a question, you can get to a microphone and... Yeah, and so we'll just first alternate, I, I guess. First, I wanted to thank you for a wonderful and engaging talk. It was really fun to listen to and fascinating. Thank what you. I wanted to ask you about, actually, I have two questions. One is, um, why is it for some people, and I would guess that probably some, many of those people are in this room right now, why is it that engaging the intellect at the some, same time that you engage emotion makes for a more uh, memorable experience? And I would contrast musicals which I think are fun and I don't go to, with plays, which I am immediately and often drawn to, even though sometimes they can be um, you know, dealing with darker things or things that are more complicated. But I often find that, that what's happening is my intellect is engaged at the same time that my emotions are. And then I think about the, the theme of this very festival, which is arts and ideas. And, but, but, so you talked about experience and emotion. Can we talk a little bit about intellect and emotion? And then my second question is if you can recommend any additional readings on some of the things that you're talking. Like if I'm an artist, what should I be reading about neuroscience that might be fun or might inform my work? I'll just start by saying something really unscientific, and then you can be scientific. But uh, to me, good theater is a gym for the soul, that you go to work out, and that you have to sweat. Uh, Steel Hammer is a particular case because it's about work, and it became clear that part of the experience of going to see it, and it's hard for me to say this, the audience actually has to work. I'm usually wanting audiences to have a little bit more zippy zippy in and out. You know, we in this country are showbiz weasels, but uh, <laughs> but but I do believe that the great theater experiences that I've ever ever had were always a little bit too hard, a little bit too long, and a little bit beyond me. And, and it's, it's, it's the, the worst thing you can do is go to a play where you feel like you're being spoken down to. But maybe you could give this some neuroscientific uh, license or Which in, part would you term. like neuroscientific license for? <laughs> well, about emotion and intellect. I think ah, that's a great yes. question. OK, so. Um, yeah. 
So one of the things that are really dramatic is that to some degree, uh, different parts of the brain do process different kinds of inputs, right? We have an auditory cortex and a visual cortex. And so one of the things that we know, for example, about memory is that when you encode the same information coming from different modalities, your memory becomes better. Um, I don't know that there's any research related to the entertainment value, for example, but I think it, it certainly stands to reason that when you're receiving um, the, the kind of the input that you're seeing in a, in a, in a theatrical piece from uh, multiple modalities that activate um, uh, different uh, parts of the brain and different and, and that comes in through uh, different um, uh, sensory modalities. Uh, what you might end up having is a richer picture or a richer resonance um, with what's going on. And I think that at least to some degree that is the um, the reason why musicals do so well, right, is that people can get really, really immersed in how um, in, in what is happening in front of them. Whether that um, ends up making it a better experience, I don't know, right? To some degree, not having it be a musical means that you do have to work more. Mm -hmm. And so if your goal as a director is to have people work, um, it's, I think that it, it makes perfect sense for you to actually strip out um, some of the modalities and let people kind of go after it um, more, more hardcore into what the meaning might be. I think that specifically when we think about cognition and emotion as, as, as interacting capacities, um, you can think about um, the, the emotional capacity as something that happens probably much more automatically, right? That emotional resonance we know, for example, in the process of just understanding other people outside of the context of theater, um, you know, even babies when they're basically born, they start mimicking. Right, that's something that comes up really, really quickly, and emotional resonance is something that happens practically automatically. Um, and people, of course, vary maybe in their ability to to do that automatically and do it accurately. Um, but it's certainly something that, as an ability, happens automatically. The ability to reason about what other people are uh, thinking is something that develops later, requires more complexity, and actually continues to develop throughout early childhood in a way that really you don't get much better at mimicry than you do uh, when you're really, really little. And so I think that when you have the combination of both of these things, especially if you're, if you're working, right, then you're doing the act of um, uh, reasoning about what it is that the um, characters are thinking or characters are doing, you're probably making your own experience much more um, in depth and much more rich, and you're also likely to remember it better later. Um, in terms of reading, I would say that you're probably a better... No, no, you're the... You're yeah, the... but what, what appeals to me is probably, in terms of reading, is... If we're in, interested in our, what kind of about neuroscience, or perhaps some of the, 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 the book you were reading when you were met the author, I don't know. R. Grandstein, yeah. Grandstein? It's a lovely book, but the, the, uh, there, the, help me out. There's some great books that I always forget the titles. Um, yes, you got one? Uh, Antonio Damasio has one. It's yeah, the, really the great. Emotion and feeling or something. Yeah. The title, but there's some fascinating stuff about yeah. how we process meaning. Steven Pinker is also easy to read, kind of. Yeah. You think? Rudolf Arnheim. Arnheim, going back, yeah. Um, George Lakoff has some good stuff about. About frame analysis, scary. Huh? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> about about why why we <clears throat> why we believe what we do based on how it's framed. That's terrifying. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Naively, the word director sort of means the person who tells other people what to do. That's yeah. clearly a diametrically opposed to, I'll bet, your conception as a theater director now. Could you elaborate on what your experience over the last 10 years, how that has changed sure. your definition of the word director? Yeah, my job as a director, and I think the word is right, I say, and quite naively, we're going over here, gang. <laughs> My job is to, is to become infected with a, a, a curiosity and an interest about something. It could be in a play that's already written. It could be in, in a subject matter like neuroscience. And then I, start, then I dream of a world in which it might happen. Certainly, Steel Hammer, I was dealing with Julia Wolfe's music and the idea of, of embodying the story of John Henry. And so... I dreamt about the world in which it could happen, and I thought it could be some cross between a tent show and 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 and, um, uh, uh, and then I uh, uh, I didn't finish that sentence a, a tent show and a, a storytelling circle I don't know and uh, and um, and then what I do is I do a lot a lot of research usually for about two years before we start rehearsals. I upload everything I know, every stupid idea I've ever had 
takes usually an entire rehearsal of eight hours to upload my research to the actors, the designers, and then I forget it because they've heard it. And quite often, the dumbest ideas that I say on that first day will come back in tech, and somebody will remember it and try it out. So once I've done that, I, I, I turn to the actors, I turn to the designers, and I say, well, the designers happens much earlier, but that's another story. And, and I respond to what they start to create, and I edit. Uh, I edit what's happening. And I, I have some capacity for visual composition, and I use that. Uh, some capacity for the musicality of an event, and I use that, but I'm an editor. Thank you for the question. We're on this side now. Yeah. Thanks again. This is great. What you've been discussing is so relevant to poetry, both uh. in the creating and the reading, aloud or not, and, and in the memory, the business of memory not being fact very often, but it is truth. Mm. And I wonder if you could comment on poetry and, and staging and acting and if you have further comments on that. I have, I have a, uh, I appreciate the question and I, I, it's another thing I want to try out on you. Okay. Okay, you know when they used to say it was left brain and right brain? Uh -huh. Okay, so this is the theory I've been, been, been espousing and it has a lot to do with poetry because I think what makes theater unique from many other art forms is it's both prose and poetry. You can go from a prose situation to a very poetic, physical expression of an idea and then back to a prose dialogue. Do you know what I'm saying? That you go back and forth. And so how you get from one to the other is really interesting. And if you look at like musical theater, all the music theater geeks say, you sing when you can't speak anymore, that the emotions get so big that you go to singing. Well, I think that line, let me just say, OK, I know it's not left and right. OK, I know that, but I'm going to say it anyway. So you're, you're, you're in um, a prose world, and you have to kick yourself over into the, into the uh, poetry world. So the, say, the difference between writing prose and then writing poetry, you go to a different function. And it's a, it's a real brain switch. If everybody in this room, if you think of a, of, a, of a nursery rhyme from childhood, just try doing it, I bet you looked up to the right or the left. We access poetry on the right side of the brain. I know, I know, it's not right. Uh, <laughs> you access poetry on the right. So the difference between pedestrian movement and suddenly dancing, the difference between speaking and singing, the difference between writing prose and writing poetry is a synaptical brain change. Am I right? Uh, <laughs> I think that there's, uh, that has never been tested directly. I think it's a, it's, <laughs> I think it's actually to some degree a testable hypothesis that someone should, uh, should maybe study. Yeah. I think that in a lot of ways, uh, the difference between song and poetry has to do with elaboration. And to some degree, music, right, uh, may be lateralized. And speech is definitely lateralized, right? So the, the verbal interpretation itself, uh, almost in everybody, certainly belongs on the left. So, so actually, the idea of right, right and left brain is not fully wrong. Probably it's just, right. I think, for, for some yeah. period of time, was uh, yeah. overly, uh, overly used in some contexts. Um, but I think that what's uh, really exciting is the idea that you can think about um, and, and interpret ideas that come from theater into neuroscience. And, I, and actually, one yeah. of the questions that I wanted to ask you um, is to, to what degree you think that um, your work in theater has given you insights on psychology that we haven't yet figured out. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, theater certainly gives you insights. That clock says 12, 12 wait, what is it? It's, it's counting down. Oh, it's counting down. Yeah. OK. <laughs> the brain has to watch out for the time, too. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 going back to your question about being a director, the one thing you have to be able to enjoy is juggling psychologies. Because you're juggling psychologies of a lot of actors, designers, crew. You know, everybody is in a different mood. And if you don't enjoy that juggling, there's no there there. there <laughs> you have to be able to do that. But I can't possibly say how 
I can't possibly answer that question. I mean, to some degree, what one might imagine that you could answer that question by saying, hey, I came up with that ensemble piece, right? Which to some degree, um, or, or the, the way that you organize people in a space yeah. and having the insight about that, that that might be how kind of natural communication arises. But there's more than that, and then coming to you, um, there's more than that. You know, one of my favorite American filmmakers, um, uh, Robert Altman, <laughs> God rest his soul. He said, I saw it once in a, a, a DVD extra. Remember how they used to do extras? And it was an interview. And he said, think of any film I made. He said, think of the five favorite moments in it. And I can guarantee you those moments were accidents. <laughs> that he had the brilliance of bringing together really talented actors and crew and letting it rip and letting accidents happen. And that's another aspect of the theater that you can't be like a secretary director. You can't say, OK, I've got to get this done by this time, and this, this, by, and, and this is the way it's got to be. You actually have to create a circumstance and a little social system in which shit happens. <laughs> and then you have to say, the scary thing is keep it. That, we'll, we'll, we'll incorporate yeah. that. That's what happens. Yes. Yes. Um, I find what moves me most in theater is when I feel it in my body. And yeah. so if there's theater that doesn't have physicality and sound and rhythm, those are things that I really feel in my gut and in my heart. And I think that's part of what really moved me about Steel Hammer. Um, and also what moves me is story is one of the most moving parts for me is John Henry in the prison cell and yeah. Polly Ann outside of the prison cell. And that, that was a very powerful image of the, the chairs that were sort of the yeah. bars of the, of the jail cell. Um, so for me, that, that's really a story where there's a character who I can identify with and there's two characters who are identifying with each other and I can enter into their world and enter into their minds and enter into their hearts a bit. Um, and really the performance of Steel Hammer has both. It has these very abstract moments where it's the sound and the, the motion that's you know, hitting me in my gut. And then it had that moment where there's more of a story. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious about, about those two different modes because I went to a storytelling workshop recently where uh, the person who had, was helping us become storytellers told us these sort of archetypal story arcs. First he said, you know, you lay out where you are, you, you bring your audience into a place, and then you go on a journey, and then you come back, but you come back a different person. That's the traditional story. That's, that's, that's uh, H Homer's uh, Odysseus. Odysseus. Yeah. So just wondering about, I mean, what I love about Steel Hammer is, in a way, time is very cyclical. And just what was happening in 1877 is happening today. Yeah. Um, slavery is continuing in the prison yeah. system. Um, but there's also just a desire for me to, to meet characters and to see a certain story arc. Yeah, yeah. I want to respond to a number of things that you said. Thank you. And it actually goes back to the poetry issue. You know, if you film that scene you're talking about, which is a prison is made by a circle of chairs, if you film that, it would look so stupid. <laughs> you know, if you, you don't have, where's the prison? There's a circle of chairs. In some ways, I'm really dedicated to making theater that would look ridiculous on film and television. <laughs> because it's a different language. It's a language of poetry, certainly. And it's a language of associations. And it gives the audience something to do. If you describe everything on the stage, the audience has no participation. So in the theater, you try to do the least bit you can in order that the audience has a job. That their job is to co-create the event, so you leave clues that are just enough for the audience then to make to 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 make it up. But in the second part of your question, and something that um, I noticed, two particular world-class theater directors have taught me. One is Robert Lepage, and the other is uh, Complicité. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Bernie. Bernie. Yeah, Simon McBurney. In both of those companies, Complicité and, and, um, and, and Lepage's company, they deal with really big subjects, but always at the heart 
are these little characters who are affected by the subjects. In other words, in this country, we have a disease of, and it's due to the McCarthy era. I'm not going to go there now, but um, <laughs> we do things. It, it, the plays are often about you and me and our problems in our apartment. And that's because, because of politics, because, because there was a, such an effective movement in the, the history of this country where artists became afraid of talking about bigger issues. But you can't deal with the big, if you just have a big abstract physical event where you feel involved physically, that's not enough. You need, you need situations that you relate to as a human being. I remember seeing this show years ago that was directed by a guy who died too young of AIDS. His name was Reza Abdo. If anybody knew his work, it was so extreme and so violent and so huge. And, and I went to see a show he did in, 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 um, in Los Angeles. And it had, like, I, excuse my language, it had a 15-foot dildo on the stage. It had, it, like, it had a, uh, it was Orpheus and Eurydice. And Orpheus was played by a woman, and Eurydice was played by a man. And Orpheus was bald woman with a, a mo motorcycle. There was a capoeira group on stage. <laughs> there were, like, there were screens with all this stuff. I mean, you, loud music. It was so extreme. And I went there with my then girlfriend, Tina Landau, and we were sitting together watching it. And uh, when it was over, it was this loud, really huge thing. I was sitting next to her, and I looked at the program. And there was a little picture of Orpheus and Eurydice from the play whose heads were t leaning in towards each other. And I looked at Tina, and I said, that's us. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why he was a great director, is that he was able to do these massively huge things, but have this human experience in the center of it, which was so touching and related to my quotidian life. And you have to have both, in a sense. Otherwise, it's just impressive, you know, or, oh, it felt good. But, but in the theater, you need also the, 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 the particulars of, of character, I think. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, I don't know if you had something to say. No, go ahead. How do you think um, memory affects an artist's expression or how they like create art? Say one, one more time. How do you think memory affects an artist's expression or how they create art? Oh, golly. I, I'm going to give this to Hetty, but I just have to say it's really important as a young artist to see things and experience things that you've never done before, because that's going to create massive new memories. You know, like get yourself on a train or a plane and go somewhere that you don't have speak the language. And you, all of a sudden, everything will imprint themselves on you. And it will change you as an artist. So the memories that you create create you as an artist. Do you know what I'm saying? It's really important to go places, see things, meet people, and be completely uh, 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 out of your element. It creates memories that change who you are. Yeah. I mean, you deal with cognitive brain behavior stuff, which yeah. is all about the answer to your question, I think. It's, it's hugely important. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that how you end up interpreting your environment, one, is dictated by what you already know and what you already remember, uh, uh, and that it has a, a profound influence on the kind of responses that you might um, create. And so in that sense, and I don't know really anything about becoming an artist, um, but I, I think about how people um, change their behaviors in, in, in ways that uh, maybe allow them to grow as humans. And certainly knowing what of the thoughts that come up in your head are memories, uh, having true respect for how limited they are in terms of how accurate they are, um, right? And how, how likely it is that every thought that you have is really truly your own creation as opposed to some mm. perfect representation of something that really happened in the past. I think that that really opens you up in a profound way to everything that is to come, including new experiences that might shape you, um, including uh, producing artistic endeavors. So I would certainly uh, maybe th take that moment uh, to understand how um, everything you think to some degree is your own. Thank you. Yeah. We've got two minutes and 12 seconds. I'll talk fast. <laughs> um, my, question, my question concerns what you talked about, about um, brain waves attuning or resonating with one another. And I'm really curious about whether or not that is entirely an automatic process, or whether motivation or intention or volition can impact that. And secondarily, whether someone's prior emotional state 
can affect how that happens? Yeah, those are both really, really fantastic questions, and I'll try to answer really quickly. Um, the first part is uh, um, this issue of um, whether it's intentional. There certainly is now budding research that suggests that certain conditions might increase your tendency to, to resonate with other people or decrease it. So for example, when you think people are similar to you, you tend to resonate with them more and be more empathic. Um, That's when depressing. You, yeah, that is depressing, actually. Um, and when you think that people are in your out group, uh, you tend to do that less, which is, I think, depressing. really the depressing part, yeah. Um, but, but it is true that it happens, um, and it suggests that at least to some degree you may be more motivated to understand particular people than you are others. Um, the second part of that is, can, and I think that this is related to the idea that you can actually increase people's motivation um, to try to be more empathic and to resonate. Um, and one way is to actually make them your in-group, right, which you can uh, do in certain ways by even thinking about the fact that everybody is the same. Um, and there's also recent research that suggests that compassion meditation uh, is one way in which people might become more resonant and more empathic to other people. Um, you do that? I, I've been meditating for a very, very long time, yeah. And I, I think that both mindfulness and compassion and loving kindness meditations each has, uh, has had a profound effect on how I interact with the world. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. I think we have to draw to a close. I'm so sorry. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody.